Welcome to the BetUS College Football Show. It is the Tuesday, April 9th edition of the show. I'm your host, Gary Seegers. Of course, you can follow me on all the different socials, at GaryWCE. And look, we got the Final Four, uh, the Basketball National Championship out of the way. WrestleMania is over. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if you are not already prepping for the 2024 college football season, you are already behind. But fear not, we got the experts here today to help catch you up. On the left side of the screen, of course, the numerical guru, our stats guy. Uh, he's our analyst. Uh, he's knee-deep in UFL spring football ratings right now. Uh, he is at Stats of War on X, Parker Fleming. Parker, uh, football is back on the TV. And, and next week, of course, the transfer portal opens up. Uh, it's time to get crazy, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Gary, don't sell me short. I tweeted out some version zero of uh, 2024 win totals. So just putting some pen to paper as an exercise of, you know, if I generally think this team is this and this is their schedule, what what's a range of win totals? So that's been fun. The USC fans are f- furiously searching for my home address <laughs> to throw eggs at my windows. But other than that, it's going all right. So <laughs> USC fans, uh, I, I don't feel like there's a whole lot of those, but I mean, you guys prove me wrong here. I, I feel like that is a, a blue blood you know, we can save that for another time. We'll talk plenty about USC. Uh, on the right side of the screen, of course, our award-winning professional handicapper. Uh, this man wins at everything, but he is the most passionate about college football. He is at Kyle Hunter Picks on X. Uh, Kyle Hunter. Kyle, I am certain that you were glad to be done with college basketball for a little while, right? Yeah, I love college basketball, and it's like, uh, you know, the race between college football and college basketball is really close for me, but uh, I think college football is just like the slight half step ahead, uh, but don't tell the guys on college basketball. Um, the the college basketball season is fantastic, but I've got to tell you, it's such a grind. I think that's why I put college oh, yeah. football first is because you get a few days off, and that's the next week where college basketball is every single day for five months, but it was a, a fun season. Uh, UConn deserved to win it. They were fantastic all the way and uh, excited to talk college football. I almost trolled Parker yesterday with his win totals, just, you know, like saying Ohio State's this low. Like, but I figured somebody else would do that for me, so I didn't have to mess with him. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. He got plenty of it. Not yeah. just USC fans, uh, but basically everybody has hit up Parker about those win totals. Uh, Kyle, do me a favor. Tell the beautiful people how they can help out the show, my friend. Yeah, you can just go down there and hit that thumbs up button. That helps us out a lot. Uh, jump in the chat and uh, subscribe to the channel. I mean, we got 18,200 subscribers. I'm excited to see that grow as we go into the next season. Um, you know, so uh, thumbs up. Uh, hit the bell, too, so you know when we go live, because we're going to be going live a decent amount of times here in the off season. Uh, I'm sure Gary will be telling you more about that, but uh, that way you know every single time. Oh, yes, yes. We'll uh, We'll be here next week. Uh, talking NFL draft. We're going to be here two weeks after that to talk about the end of the transfer portal, uh, or at least the portal window closing, et cetera. So we, we're going to be here quite a bit uh, in the in the non-active period. So make sure that you are subscribed, as Kyle said, and uh, make sure and join us. As always, you know, we got to remind you, subscribe to the podcast as well, the Bet U.S. Football Show. You can help us out there by leaving a nice five-star review on whatever app it is that you're using, Apple, Spotify, whatever. Uh, make sure, of course, to keep an eye on the latest odds at betustv.com slash odds. And, uh, and you can join in on the action at betustv.com slash join. Gentlemen, we've got a packed show, so let's go ahead and get after it. We're going to go on with topic number one here. And we're not going to spend too, too long on this. Uh, but this they talked about an 80-team Super League. Uh, it was revealed last week that the idea of this Super League uh, was thrown around by some fairly influential people. Uh, it included names like West Virginia President Gordon Gee, uh, Syracuse Chancellor uh, Kent Siverud. I hope I said that right, uh, the NFL's number two executive Brian Rollup, 76ers owner David Blitzer, and more. And their reasoning uh, for this idea was headlined as uh, the current system is doomed and headed for bankruptcy. Now, the names behind it are certainly impressive, and the idea sounds somewhat intriguing, uh, And the idea is this. You're going to have seven 10-team divisions and another 10-team division that is set up for promotion and relegation with another group of about uh, 30 to 40 teams. Um, Now, this made a huge splash last week. It got everybody talking. But the truth of the matter is we are nowhere close to something like this happening. And the first reason behind that is the SEC and the Big Ten are not on board with it yet. Uh, Their media contracts go through 2031 and 2034 uh, and second, you know, if any other conferences were on board with something like this, 
they would not have all just agreed to a six-year extension for the college football playoff. Now, I'm curious you guys' thoughts here. I, I believe we will eventually see something like a Super League, uh, but I think we're we're talking significantly fewer teams probably. And my guess would be somewhere around 40 or so. Um, but maybe, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I, I'm curious what you guys think. Parker first and, and then Kyle. What do y'all think about this? Aren't the Big Ten and the SEC already doing this? This feels like one of those things where like. people outside of football start talking about it and don't really have a good idea that like of what's kind of happening right here. I mean, I've said it, I've said it before and I'll say it again, read the night report. We got to divorce the other sports. I think that's the biggest hurdle here is yeah. get football and maybe even basketball um, outside of that structure and, and stop making the cross country team travel to all this nonsense and the rowing team and, and all that, let that be regional and then go to this kind of super league. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, of the uh, of the impression that what's happening right now is an agglomerate and abdicate kind of process for the schools under the NCAA. I also mentioned saying something I haven't said before. Um, this would require someone like Greg Sankey giving up a lot of power and a lot of discretion to someone else. And I do not believe the incentive structure exists for him to do that. Um, I, I don't think there's any reason for him to make any concessions uh, to, to engage anyone on college football on anyone else's terms at all. And so I, I think that's second I think it grabs headlines, but I really think that the, the current model of what we're seeing is these forces agglomerating. We'll see Florida State, North Carolina, ACC kind of, we'll see some bifurcation there. Some of those guys get into there. And then uh, I, I do believe that the Big Ten and the SEC aren't going to leave people out in the cold forever. So I will say that's hard to say with what they just did to Oregon State and Washington State, for instance. <laughs> but I don't think the long term plan is just to choke off these teams. I, I think we'll actually see a good amount of natural separation. The ACC is a good conference to keep an eye on right now for that. There are people who are spending and people who are not spending. I won't go line by line and tell you, but you can tell which teams are which. And I think that's what's going to really matter is some of these teams, like some of these coaches we've seen, are going to say, man, this is too much. We're going to we're going to drop down and, and become, you know, uh, FCS, not, not, not that they'll exactly drop to that. I think we'll see some blurring the lines there, but I think there'll be some natural selection before there is some kind of authoritarian top down. Hey, we're going to, we, you know, the, the basketball executives are going to take over college football. I think that's, that's a little bit of a pipe dream. I think we're, we're seeing some natural forces here. We're, we're seeing the COVID rosters phase out. We're in the post saving era. There's more uncertainty in college football right now than there has been in a really, really long time um, as to what college football's future is going to be. So I wouldn't be, you know, I'm not losing sleep thinking about the, the basketball execs taking over uh, football or anything. I, I think the the natural na uh, natural forces that we see happening right now will continue to work. I think we'll see an equilibrium that's that's based on spending, uh, and it'll be really self selection. University presidents are just going to say, "Hey, we we can't have a seven figure nil budget budget every year. That just doesn't work. And if that's what we need to compete, we're going to have to do something else." So well, I think we'll see some of that happening. There's quite a bit going on actually today in a uh, Leon County courthouse down in Florida. Uh, that that could have a lot to do with what the ACC looks like going forward. Uh, Kyle, you know, I, I'm curious your thoughts here. You know, I know you've been knee deep in college basketball and whatnot, but uh, I gave you a little debriefer here. Uh, got any thoughts on this one? I was going to say, I, I've definitely spent more time uh, breaking down the hard court here lately than I have thinking about the super conference or super leagues here. Um, I, the main takeaway I had is kind of what you guys already said. It's, it feels like um, people giving up power that wouldn't want to give up power at this point. So uh, we're talking about something that's such far out there that we have plenty of things that we could, uh, you know, hone in on before that comes. I, I think Parker's point, too, is a great one about you know, uh, disconnecting football and the other sports because it's going to be really hard to make um, things work if you keep making every single team you know, cross country track, you know, things like that. Uh, there's tons of sports. We know football drives the bus, uh, but something's going to have to be separated out for this to, to make too much sense here in the long run. So um, not too much to add other other than that, really. Yeah, the uh, the house case is something for uh, everybody to pay attention to as far as, you know, the money and whatnot and whether or not some of these programs may have enough to uh, fully function. So uh, I would recommend that you go Google that, uh, but look at the house case versus NCAA. That's a, that's going to be a huge, huge deal. Let's move on to topic number two. We, like I said, we got a lot to talk about today and we're going to hit on just a ton of teams, uh, but topic number two, we're going to hit on spring game recaps. Uh, now we had several spring games over the weekend, uh, not a ton. We're going to have the most this coming weekend on the 13th and a bunch on the 20th as well. 
Uh, but let's let's rapid fire through some of these. I'll give you what we learned about these teams from the spring games. Then I want you guys' reaction and you know maybe some quick expectations going forward. Uh, we'll start off with Clemson here. Uh, Cade Klubnick was just okay. He threw a pick early. Uh, looked a little better as the spring game went on, but looked kind of the same as he did last year. Uh, the backup quarterback Trent Pearman, uh, he looked great. He had a huge run, a a perfect short touchdown pass. Uh, the most hyped recruits that they had, uh, the wide receiver Wesco, uh, the uh, linebacker Sammy Brown, certainly looked like they're going to contribute this season. Uh, Kyle, you know, we'll start with you. Can Clemson win the ACC this year? Is there, does it seem like uh, like they should be the favorite here? I mean, the, the defense dominated in that spring game, right? I don't think anybody's yeah. shocked about that. The offense has had negative 19 yards in the first two possessions. I think Pearman was kind of thought of as the third string quarterback before that. So, you know, him stepping up was pretty impressive. I think Wesco gives them a potential playmaker, a wide receiver that they really have lacked. And I think we've talked about that before. You know, for a long time, Clemson had great wide receivers. They haven't had that the last couple of years. Um, the other guy is uh, Jamal Anderson Jr., uh, yeah, it makes me feel old, to be honest. You know, Jamal Anderson Jr. is uh, going to be starring here because uh, Jamal Anderson was fantastic. Uh, I think uh, Clemson uh, being the favorite makes sense, but um, am I terribly excited to trust Clemson? Not really. So it's it's one of those things where uh, I think they should be the favorite. Do I want to bet on Clemson as the favorite? Probably not. Yeah, they've got a ton of talent here. Uh, Parker, you got anything to add on uh, on Clemson here? Yeah, I mean, got, got to step up at the wide receiver. I, I think they have to have a dude emerge. Their five top targets last year, uh, 1.50 yards per route run was the highest. Um, and uh, the other four guys were all, were all you know, like 1.15, kind of not super productive. Nobody is really the emergent threat. And I think, um, you know, last year was kind of wasted with a guy like Will Shipley, where he's so versatile. But if that's the only engine, his versatility kind of becomes a crutch. And they really need to develop some offense on the outside. If Wesco can do that, um, power to him. I think that's a dimension they haven't really unlocked, but he is a freshman. He's not huge. I think he's 170 on the roster right now. So uh, that's not exactly the deep body kind of ball guy. How, how are they going to uh, attack uh, uh, vertically is something I'm really, really interested in. I'll, I'll say now and not say again, the golden rule of spring football. If your defense looks really good, uh, in spring football, your offense is bad. If your offense looks really good, it's because your defense is bad. I think we we know which side of the equation Clemson falls into <laughs> after uh, after that showing. Even as you know, spring games are spring games. Eh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter too much. But Wesco is a nice uh, a nice pull by Kyle there. That's that's an interesting piece that I think if we look back at this season and say, hey, Clemson ran the table, went to the playoff, won a couple games, it's because Wesco was really opened up the offense a little bit and gave them a, a dude at wide receiver, which they've they've been suffering from lack of dudes. Yes, yes. And remember, this is year two under uh, under Riley, the offensive coordinator there. So, you know, we'll see what this uh, what this looks like. Let's move over to the Plains, Auburn, Alabama. Hugh Freeze had his second spring game inside Jordan Hare Stadium, and we saw the debut of their new defense coordinator, DJ Durkin. Uh, defense did look pretty solid. Uh, the quarterback Peyton Thorne looked okay as well. Uh, the backup battle at quarterback could get really interesting. Uh, they've got a uh, a new five star freshman wide receiver, Cam Coleman. He looked like an absolute star. Uh, and the new kicker, I mean, good gracious, Towns Mago, uh, was seven of seven on field goals. That includes the game winner that was from 58 yards. Uh, Parker, should Auburn fans expect you know massive improvement this season, or uh, maybe pump the brakes a little bit and uh, and let's reel this thing in and and maybe 2025 is what they should be looking at. Sorry, I was taking an internal moment to center myself about remembering Hugh Freeze hired DJ Durkin. Uh, <laughs> what a what a program, man! Yeah, I I think it's interesting to see what they do at, at quarterback. Um, obviously, the kicker being the highlight of the spring game is not <laughs> exactly what you yes. want. Um, but uh, you know. Their, their offense last year, just the, the, the only passes they could throw were downfield. I mean, and, and it was really just kind of chucking it. Um, I, I really think they need to make some strides in the passing game. Portal's about to open. Do you take a look? Uh, is Hugh Freeze confident in his ability to navigate his current quarterback room, bring that in? I think if you roll with Thorne, you're saying, eh, we kind of are what we are this year and don't have any big designs on going to the playoff. I, I actually would encourage them, especially if they can get a guy with with maybe one more year of eligibility uh, to come in and, and kind of normalize a little bit in the quarterback room just because the – like. 
snaps are a signal, you know, like we, we, we know what Peyton Thorne is. It's not like there's this other dimension of Peyton Thorne that Hugh Freeze is going to unlock and he's going to become this transcendent quarterback. That's going to be the game breaking difference maker they need. And, and so I think it's worth taking a swing in the portal. That's something I'm watching on uh, the next couple of weeks too, to see if, if they do in fact do that, or if they're just going to roll it out and try and be a little more physical and see if they can grind out some wins. Kyle, what about you? Uh, what do you, what do you think about Hugh Freeze's team this year? Coleman's definitely the one to watch uh, this year. Um, I think it'll be fun, too, to see Sam Jackson, um, you know, the the quarter, quarterback turned wide receiver, you know, pretty interesting situation there. I, I think my biggest question mark is Thorne. Um, you know, Thorne can run a decent amount, but I do – I, I do have concerns as to, you know, what his upside or what his ceiling is as a passer. Um, they're going to have better wide receivers out there this year, but can Peyton Thorne be the guy that makes this offense be really good? Um, I mean, they usually can run the football. They probably can run it again this year. They have to be better at passing if they want to take a huge step up. Um, I think the defense looked pretty good, but, you know, you could say what Parker said there earlier. Maybe the offense isn't too great. So uh, we will see here about Auburn. You brought up passing. Let's move over to NC State. Of course, the new quarterback over there uh, from Coastal Carolina, Grayson McCall. Uh, He looked smooth. He went 16 of 20 for 205 yards and two TDs in the first half. Uh, The running back that everybody's been raving about, Jordan Waters, he had seven carries and 69 yards uh, to go along with the touchdown there. The offense looks worlds better than it did last season. Uh, The defense was missing potentially five expected starters. Uh, But, you know, again, spring ball, uh, we'll see what happens uh, over the summer, et cetera, as we go into fall camp. But uh, I expect the defense to be fine under Tony Gibson. Uh, Kyle, look, there's a pretty high ceiling in Raleigh, uh, especially with the schedule that misses Florida State and Miami. Uh, what, what do you see here? The format of the NC State spring game is kind of a weird one, right? So it's 51-7. Yeah. I think they put, like, almost all the first-teamers on the same team. I, you know, not too many people do that. Um, it, it makes it kind of hard to know what to make of of the team compared to some of the other spring games. We know, you know, there's lots of offense versus defense. There's different ways that you do it, but NC State's is is one of the more awkward ones that I've seen. Uh, Grayson McCall is going to be great. We know how good Grayson McCall is. If NC State has that running game, if Waters is that guy, NC State's offense is going to be way better. Like it's going to go light years better than what it has been. And I do trust a good defensive coordinator uh, to do a good job here. I, I think we've seen enough out of Gibson that NC State's defense is not, you know, going to drop off terribly. So uh, I think the upside's definitely here for NC State. Parker, what about you? I look, I'm big on NC State. Uh, again, if you're if you're missing Florida State and Miami on the schedule. But I've always I've got a soft spot for Dave Dorn. I don't know what it is. Like I just I feel like that program is eventually going to break through. Uh, what what are you saying with the Wolfpack? It's certainly a testament to their defensive quality year over year that my heuristic for which ACC games I should watch when I'm scouting offenses is the NC State game every time. That's kind of my litmus test for an ACC offense. It's like, all right, how'd you do against NC State? What I'm worried about is what they did to my boy Brennan Armstrong, fellow redhead there, uh, absolute gunslinger, turned into the scramble master. 21% of NC State's offensive successes in 2023 came from QB scrambles alone, not even designed runs. Really felt like they just threw their hands up and said, we can't get the downfield game going. And The only reason that's problematic, not that I have, you know, big, big plans for Brennan Armstrong in the future as as an NFL quarterback or anything, but saying we we saw him do it at that exact same level um, and saw him air it out and they really couldn't do it. So a little bit worried about my boy, Grayson McCall. The one thing that is interesting there is, is, you know, the the, the blueprint for McCall to succeed is structure, right? We're going to get some motion. We're going to get some play action. So if they've got the offensive line play, which they do have a history of very solid offensive line play, if they can conjure that magic up again, say, let's take a collective breath on offense. Let's let these plays develop bolstered by a run game that doesn't involve the quarterback. I, I, I'm optimistic that there is a balanced path for, for NC State. That being said, I, I was optimistic about their downfield attack with Armstrong, and I really feel like they ran him into the ground a little bit. So can they reach uh, McCall's potential, I think, is a bigger question for me than the defense uh, at all. Let's uh, let's move into some of these G5s that had games over the, uh, the weekend. We won't spend as long on these. Uh, but UNLV... Uh, they they had former Campbell quarterback Haj Malik Williams. Uh, he looked pretty good. He had three touchdown passes. Uh, again, this is another one that the spring game is a little wonky. Uh, it's a little different, uh, kind of like the NC State one. Uh, Barry Odom told the media they held out several impact guys on defense to uh, to heal up a little bit. 
Overall, this team is number six in the Mountain West in adjusted returning production, and there's a lot of new faces. But this is another one. I, I got faith in Barry Odom. I got faith in the offensive coordinator, Brennan Marion. Uh, Parker, was last year just a one-off, or should we maybe expect big things from the Rebels this year? I don't know how you can run a bad offense with Ricky White outside. Lead, led the nation in yards per route run, 4.05. Did not transfer. I think that's huge. I, huge. I liked Jordan Maiava. I, I think he had some good potential. Obviously, Lincoln Riley snagged him, um, but I don't think that he was necessarily the governor there. I think that they're going to have, uh, whether, whether it's Malik Williams or, or Matt Sluka from Holy Cross, so I think should end up starting there if all goes yeah. according to plan. Uh, he'll be a true running threat, which kind of changes things as well. One thing I like too, if you look at his uh, numbers from last year, PFF grade 92.3 on offense, you know, you think about competition there, but he was throwing it on offense where he had three seconds to throw on average, which is great because UNLV, speaking of structure, speaking of motion, is going to do all sorts of weird stuff. I really like from UNLV, this is just kind of fun inside baseball to watch. Um, UNLV ran trips the second fewest so a trips look through right as you to one side, the second fewest of any college football team uh, last year. Navy was the only team that, that showed that look uh, last. They were number one in explosive play percent when they ran a trips look. So uh, that's something fun to watch for with UNLV is when they line those three guys up and then get Ricky White, just a little bit of space, you're screwed. There's just no defending it. So if they can get Sluka or or Haas Williams as a, uh, a running threat, you know, we've seen him in some fun games over the years as well. Uh, I think that really opens up some dimensionality on offense, which is uh, just, I mean, having having the the structure of Barry Odom and the mind of Brennan Marion, that, that just frees up a lot of fun stuff but ricky white if he's not already a household name i would be shocked if he's not on the bolitnikoff list uh the entire season uber productive receiver very very good and uh so whoever ends up at quarterback is going to have a nice position to uh put up some monster yards they think about this michigan state had him they had uh reed and they had keon coleman in the same wide receiver unit and and for whatever reason had to lean on the running back that season i mean just bananas just bananas uh kyle you got a thought on uh, unlv here uh, i mean i think whoever's quarterback is going to benefit pretty nicely from throwing to ricky white you know like parker was saying um it makes your job a lot easier i think grimes in the secondary for unlv is probably the key um unlv had a glaring weakness last year in the secondary we remember the kansas game i mean jason bean's good but he threw 28 passes for 449 yards. So they got they had some problems they had to fix there. Um, Grimes is a former five-star recruit. This is a big-name guy to come in for UNLV, uh, kind of comes home. I think he had said he was going to go to Michigan State, right? And then he came back uh, to go to uh, UNLV. I think Grimes could help them a lot. Uh, the defense wins this one 64-53. This is definitely one of those wild games. For a second, I thought I was looking at a college basketball game again. Uh, <laughs> but, no, I think I think the key is can UNLV's pass defense be a lot better? I do trust the offense to be pretty good as long as White's out there. Uh, we'll move over to SMU, who is now in the AAC, and I did not mean to bunch them in with the G5s, but – I'm here, for, I'm here for the disrespect, Gary. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's, there's so many changes in college football this year. I mean, it's just, it's going to be nuts. Uh, but look, SMU defensive line looks huge. There's a ton of talent at the skill positions. Uh, the running back, Kamar Wheaton, has had a just incredible spring. And the wide receiver, Jake Bailey, had a really good spring game. Uh, the quarterback, Preston Stone, uh, the guy that broke his leg at the end of November, he was cleared for full participation at the end of spring. They didn't really do anything crazy with him, and, and you wouldn't expect them to, right? Uh, Kyle, I think SMU has a chance to be a factor in the ACC this year based on talent. Uh, but tell me, am I am I nuts on this? I think SMU is pretty good. Uh, the the defense impressed last year. I mean, uh, we didn't used to think of SMU as a good defensive team, but they're pretty good on defense, especially for a team that's playing quick. You know, they're out there quite a bit. I think the question mark for SMU is the offensive line because you're going to a tougher conference. The offensive line wasn't great last year. Think of some of the defensive lines they'll go against this year. That could be a real test. You know, even if with a uh, good quarterback, good skill position players on offense, that's going to be the question for me. I think SMU could even be kind of a sneaky under team as far as betting totals uh, inside the game because I think the defense will still be pretty good. I wonder if the offensive line will hold them back slightly. Yeah, they're scheduled. They've got a uh, so they've got TCU, of course. Uh, th that one will eventually be going away, uh, and they do have to play BYU as well. But then they get in conference play, and they've got Florida State at Louisville. Uh, they take a week off at Stanford, at Duke, 
Pitt, Boston College, at Virginia, and Cal. So it's not the most ridiculous schedule as far as opposing defensive lines and whatnot, but I mean you got some rough ones in there, especially early. Uh, Florida State and at Louisville back to back, and then you got Pitt uh, as your homecoming game. I mean, just who? Uh, Parker, what about you? SMU uh, it raise any flags for you? I, I I think they're good, and I think um, I would say if you're if you're trying to scout them for this fall, go watch the Tulane game from last year, um, where Stone was out and they still put on a, a dominant performance. I, I love that point from Kyle. This is not Sonny Dykes finding a quarterback. Um, in, in the garbage and, and turning him into a, you know, one man show. They are a very solid football team. That being said, moving to 10 power five games um, this year is, is hard. That's going to be, that's going to be pretty tough. And uh, Florida TCU, Florida state at Louisville is not an easy stretch, regardless of the quality of, you know, all, all three of those teams. That's still, you're going to get a solid physical performance out of all of them. So I think we're talking about SMU. We're talking about floor here. Um, and like, how high can they keep their floor during that early onslaught? So they're healthy in some games they theoretically should win. Duke, first year coach. Pitt, just kind of a steaming mess right now. BC, coach left, fun quarterback, but they're probably not as talented as SMU across the board. Um, and then, you know, you, you should probably win one of Cal, Virginia there. So I, I think the name of the game for SMU is can we stay healthy early on? Can we play that brand of defense? Can we hold up for 10 power five games? Uh, I, I'm optimistic that they're going to be fine. I've got them eight and a half or, or, or so wins, I think. Um, so not, not anything crazy, you know, I, I don't expect them to knock on the door of the playoff, but they are, you know, split, you know, two of three, Florida state, Louisville, TCU, SMU could coast and, and do pretty well there. So it'd be interesting to see how they hold up with that schedule this season. But I like stone if he's healthy. Um, and the defense is, is especially up front. I mean, they, they have a power five defensive line. I think that's something people won't expect. Yes, that defensive line looks massive, massive. Uh, two more right quick, the AAC. Let's uh, let's talk North Texas. Uh, the former uh, TCU quarterback, Chandler Morris, in, he's not going to be there until after the summer. Um, and last year's starter, uh, Chandler Rogers, he transferred to Cal. Uh, the quarterback, Stone Earl, looked okay. There was a reason that he did not win that job, or I guess won it, but then had it taken away uh, in the middle of the year last year. The defense may actually have the pieces that they need to work this year uh, i think the pace of the offense is still going to be uh, pretty rough uh for this defense parker uh tell me tell me some thoughts on eric morris's team here i expect chandler morris to put up stupid numbers in that conference chandler morris by no means is a bad quarterback a little undersized but in the aac i think he'll absolutely thrive uh, i expect north texas's defense to be on the field that's about all i can say in terms of hopes there <laughs> I, I i know they made some personnel or uh, some personnel changes and and are hoping to take a step forward but man it was really rough so if you're looking for overs and you're looking for high scoring games that go late into the evening on saturdays i think north texas is your fun team this year um i i expect them to be a roller coaster absolutely just because the offensive potential is there the consistency they've shown they can put up numbers but i expect opposing quarterbacks if you're into fantasy football uh you might want to be streaming quarterbacks quarterbacks against North Texas until we see some proof of concept for some defensive tightening up. I believe they were top 30 in offense last year, uh, raw, not adjusted, but, and then they were bottom, bottom 30 in defense. So they were complete polar <laughs> opposites. I'll need to see some stability out of them before I feel confident in anything other than there's going to be a lot of points in those games. There's, I, I think the AAC in general is going to be like that. I mean, it's North Texas, UAB, Memphis, yeah. et cetera. It's, the, the, you know, the like the alignment chart that like the AAC is chaotic good. That's what it's going to be yes. all season, every game, just absolute chaos and in a good way. Kyle, what about you? Any thoughts on uh, North Texas here? I was, uh, it's funny. I was perking up when, when Parker said, I expect the defense. I was like, I'm curious what he's, where he's going to go with this one. <laughs> to be on the he, field. <laughs> he did not disappoint. Um, you know, they said that they didn't have the pieces that they needed for the 3-3-5 defense last year, but I am skeptical that they're going to have them right away here this year also. And the pace that they play at, um, they didn't have Morris in this game, so the offense didn't look good. I think it will look a lot better when he's here. I tend to agree with Parker. I would want to bet overs in, in their games. I think the numbers are just going to be stupid high. So, you know, I don't know if we're just going to be able to blindly bet overs because I think everybody knows the games are going to be high scoring. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to make too much out of the spring game because it made the defense look better. But uh, I think uh, it would not be something I would want to trust. No, 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 not right now. They they just don't have a bunch of the dudes right now that they uh, that they will have after summer. Uh, last one right quick. UAB, uh, the quarterback, Jacob Zeno, is back. Uh, looked pretty good. Offense was not the problem last year. It shouldn't be this year. Uh, the two backup quarterbacks, Liddy and uh, Campbell, 
Uh, they were a combined 10 of 12 for 236 yards and two scores uh, in the game. Defense did get five sacks on Zeno, and that was against the starting offensive line, uh, and they did get an interception off of him, so maybe that means something. Uh, but, Kyle, I mean, tell me, could, could UAB and Trent Dilfer potentially be a sleeper in the AAC this season? Yeah, yeah, the defense won 53 to 13. Wow. Um, defensive line, uh, that's what, you know, when you read about UAB, that's what you're hearing the most of, of, as far as improvements. I think the defensive line will be able to get after the passer a lot better than they were. Uh, the defense is supposedly much faster than they were last year. To be honest with you, I think UAB kind of played decent down the stretch last year. You know, that was a team that yeah. um, I, I think I won the season win total under with them last year, but I was kind of concerned just because UAB was playing better at the end of last year. And I do think that UAB is kind of a buy low team. Uh, if somebody wants to be really low on, B, or on a UAB, that's a team I think will be better this year. If their defense takes any kind of step up, uh, I think they probably didn't show too much on offense in this one, but uh, UAB should be able to score points. I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem. Yeah, last year, so they they won two of their last four, uh, but they did have a close one there with uh, North Texas at the very end, 45-42 to 42 loss on the road on Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, Parker, what about you? UAB here. Six defensive guys in the portal. I think four of those are, are from Power Five, and then a couple swings. So they're definitely trying to shore up the personnel, and we'll see what they do in the spring here as well. They get a nice piece, uh, Jamoy Mays from um, from UT Chat. I think is interesting. Uh, their their offense has been super explosive. I think Zeno has played super consistently. Uh, I was a little bit worried about the fall off because they were so explosive with Hopkins and McBride, the law firm, two years ago. But last season, thirty one point five percent of their design rushes went for first downs. They were stout. They were really doing a good job with some yards after contact there so confident the offense is only going to improve and their defense was 126 last year in raw epa per play so it's not like it can get much worse it can get worse but it can't get much worse so a little bit of offensive improvement maybe even if you start to platoon some of those um uh defensive guys and can kind of in the aggregate create a decent starting defense out of out of some situational guys i think that's really interesting so i'd expect them to bring some more guys in in the portal but it does look like that defense is taking a step forward with the explosiveness on offense i mean all really they've got to do is just tamp down the explosive say hey we'll give up the 20 yard play not the 80 yard play on defense and then you're in business because you can hit the 80 yard play on offense let's all right we're going to move ahead let me go on and remind everybody right quick uh if you enjoy the show like the video, subscribe to the channel. You guys know what to do here. Uh, and, of course, jump in the chat if you've got any questions for the end of the show. I uh, see David already jumped in. What does North Carolina look back uh, at quarterback with May gone? Uh, we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. That's actually one of the topics Not as that we're going to hit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so let's uh, let's keep it moving. Let's move on to topic number three here. Uh, we're going to hit on teams that underperformed last season. Uh, so, you know... It, What we want to do when we look at teams that underperformed is we're looking for teams that could potentially make a big leap going forward in the next season. Uh, Maybe there were a few plays here or there that changed what a team's record looks like, but it isn't always telling of the actual team. So uh, this exercise is just to take a look at some of the teams that maybe should have had better records. So, gentlemen, I'm going to give you five teams that underperformed the most uh, per CFB data's post-game win expectancy. And I know, Parker, you're not a huge fan of post-game win expectancy. I think everybody's got a different formula for that. But we can, of course, continue to talk about that. Uh, it's, a good broad only... brush, it's a good broad brush me- yeah. measure, and it's well thought out. And as long as we understand what it's saying, that's totally fine. There you go. There you go. So there were, there were only two teams that were expected to have three more wins than they ended up with. And that was Nebraska. Uh, at minus 3.13, and UCF at minus 3.11. After that, uh, there were only three teams that were expected to have two wins more than their final result was, uh, and that was Virginia at minus 2.31, Akron minus 2.13, and UAB at minus 2.05. Now, Nebraska was number 132 out of 133 in turnover margin last year. They were negative 17. They were 1-5 in in one-score games. Uh, UCF, number 81 at minus two. They were two and three in one-score games. Virginia was number 114 in turnover margin. Uh, They were minus six. Um, And that's another team that was two and five in one-score games. Akron, number 124 with negative nine. They had a one-score game record of two and five as well. UAB, surprisingly, actually number 57 
uh, at, with plus one in turnovers, but the defense was atrocious. I mean, they gave up 37 points a game, uh, and they only had two one-score games the entire season. Parker, let's start with you. Uh, are these five teams, um, you know, are, are you looking to see massive improvement from these guys, or do you maybe have some other ones that you can toss out there? Not necessarily. I'll, I'll point out Virginia. I think Anthony Calandria is a, is a legitimately good quarterback. And so I think that's interesting as they kind of take a step forward and, and continue to improve there. He's made some impressive throws. And so they're one that's interesting, especially as the ACC might be a little more level, a little more open, especially in that upper middle class tier to go forward. Um, one that I have circled that is a little bit weird. Uh, I think Boise State doesn't go 0 for 4 against uh, UCF. Memphis, uh, what was that? Colorado State and then um, Fresno State. They lost all four of those games by one score last year. Obviously, some coaching turmoil. I think Ashton Jainty is a, an amazing running back. He's so good in the passing game as well. Super versatile. He'll get some more attention. So we'll see how he manages the workload there. But uh, just just kind of as a basic heuristic, a team that's historically been good, feels like they've, they, they got a good transfer in at quarterback and have a higher ceiling there. They lost two teams that they probably should have beat four times by, by one score there. And, and some of that's attributable to coaching that's a team that i think uh, underperformed last year even as they were sitting at what was that eight and eight, eight and six i think overall and they won their conference that's a good position to be in to say hey we underperformed i think there's a couple wins on that schedule they'd like to have back i, I have to imagine in boise the expectation is uh outside shot at a, at a playoff bid this year and, and anything less is 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 uh, a disaster uh bush hamden uh moved off to kentucky and let's see Dirk Cutter is who they brought back at OC for Boise. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, Which is I mean, very that's, fun. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm all about that. I'm all about that. Kyle, what about you? Is there anybody that uh, that you saw that underachieved that maybe we need to be paying attention to? I mean, I, I think um, I would agree on several of those. The UAB, Nebraska is kind of the obvious one. I mean, Nebraska has got to win some more games one of these times. Uh, they've been on this list for a while, but I think Rule does a good job. Uh, trust them to to bounce uh, pretty nicely. I think Central Michigan under the radar should be better than they were. They were three and nine against the spread last year. Overall, I think there's a pretty good coaching staff. The Mac's not very good. It wouldn't take a lot to be better for them. And I mean, if you look at their turnover margin, they recovered three fumbles last year. I mean, they just could not get turnovers. Uh, I think Central Michigan is kind of one of those like regression candidates that they just have to be better than they were last year. So under the radar when they're and I, I mean, I've said this before, Gary, I've said this before, Parker, Indiana's got to be better than they were. Uh, they they upgraded in a big way. Uh, they got a lot of really good pieces from James Madison and Signetti is a great football coach. So uh, I'll drive that bus. He uh, he has already come out. And I mean, the first day of spring practice. He said, we got too many guys out here that are playing the way that old Indiana played, and that's not going to fly here. So I love the attitude. I love that. He, he comes out and tells everybody, you know, I win. Google me. I win. We're going to win here. I love it. I love the attitude. Many people are calling Kurt Signetti the Deion Sanders of the Midwest. <laughs> and by many people, I mean me. Probably for the first time that anyone has ever said that thought right <laughs> now. Compared it. Gary, Kurt. I have two that I'm kind of in love with and feel bad that I'm in love with them. Um, I like Stanford. I think Stanford's going to be better this year. I think they're an I absolute like disaster Taylor. last year. Yeah, I like Troy yeah. Taylor. I believe in the vision. I think they'll make a leap. Here's the other one. Going to get roasted for it. A&M has so much talent. There's just so much yes. physical talent yeah. on the field. If Mike Elko can just be like, hey, don't be crazy. Just stay healthy and don't be dumb. They should win eight or nine games. They are so here, very here's easily. what I'm terrified of on those two, right? Stanford, uh, the the travel is going to be just it's ridiculous. Hard. So I don't know what that's going to look like. So I'm I'm planning to stay away from that a little bit. Uh, and then A and M, I mean, the schedule is, I mean, it's brutal, <laughs> right? It's it's so hard in the SEC. So I don't know what improvement would really look like. Even with the Exodus, they're still going to be more talented than eight nine teams on their schedule like by a good margin they should be they definitely should be that first weekend uh with notre dame i mean that's gonna tell a lot we'll know we will we will certainly know uh let's move on topic number four and we're gonna move to the other side of the coin on this and we're gonna talk about teams that overperform that maybe we'll look to fade a little bit um you know whether what they did was replicable or not, uh, we're curious whether or not they'll fall back to the pack. Uh, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to tell you six teams uh, that had more wins than their postgame win expectancy thought that they should have. Uh, there was one team that had 
four more wins than the stats said they should have, and that was Oklahoma State at 4.16. Um, just absurd what they were able to come up with. Uh, they were number 56 in turnover margin at plus two. They went five and one in one-score games. Uh, moving on from there, there was only one team that had over three more wins than the stats said they should have, and that was Washington, Kalen DeBoer and whatnot. They were number 60 died uh, with a dead-even turnover margin. They were 8-0 and o in one-score games. I mean, the back half of that uh, the, excuse me, the season was nothing but one-score games. They didn't look great until they got really to the back to a title game. Um, and they looked fantastic at that point, but just a, a team that knew how to win. Uh, and then finally, there were multiple that had more than two, uh, but less than three. And I'm going to go over four of those here. Uh, Fresno State, 2.78 uh, more wins than they should have based on postgame win expectancy. Uh, they were, let's see, five and two in one score games. Florida State, 2.70. Uh, they were three and zero in one score games. Northwestern at 2.48. They were number three in the country in turnover margin at plus 13, and they were 6-2 and two in one-score games. And then Ole Miss with Lane Kiffin, uh, number five in turnover margin at plus 11, and they went 4-0 and oh in one-score games. Kyle, uh, you first here. Who overperformed last year that maybe is going to crash back down to earth this year? Well, Tulane's had really good seasons here. Um, Fritz was fantastic. Summerall was yeah. very good. Uh, But it's tough to match their recent success. Uh, It's going to be a really hard uh, one to match. And New Mexico State, I mean, I have to say New Mexico State. uh, Kill did a great job. Pavia is gone. They went 10-3-1 against the spread, guys. They can't keep that up all the time. Regression has to come for them as well. Um, You know, and I would have definitely said Northwestern as one of mine as well. Uh, Northwestern with some really good turnover luck. Uh, A well-coached team. He did a great job with that team, but... Uh, it won't be easy to match that kind of uh, performance again. Yeah, I, I love Northwestern. Um, I I love the coaching hire. I love all of it. But, I mean, that was just a ridiculous run that they went on last year. Parker, what about you? What uh, what are you seeing as teams that overperformed? I mean, that the Oklahoma State thing was just nuts last year. Uh, Washington, I can kind of see it when you've got a quarterback like that, but – you know, Oklahoma State, like, they didn't exactly have Michael Penix back there. What uh, what do you see? That's where that's where Mike Gundy lives, baby. Mike Gundy's life is the entirely <laughs> is, epitomi- is the epitome of uh, you're not locked in. I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. Like, that is the, that is how they live, man. I don't know what it is, but they eke those out. Um, I, I like those. We see some obvious regression from some of those. Uh, I think I have four that are or not as much like, oh, they're going to be worse because they overperformed last year, but just kind of the market fundamentals looking down so much. As I hate it. I think Missouri, their offense is still going to be good. But, you know, you, I, I think you hit a ceiling last year. I think that's about as good as Missouri can get. Uh, and I mean, that as a compliment. They were a great team last year, but you lose a lot on the defensive side, especially coaching staff. And I think that's pretty tough for them. UNC, I think a lot of their production was Drake May doing stuff. And uh, that's that's really hard to do again, um, and, and especially in that first year we saw, you know, they, they basically took away every offensive weapon he had last year and and still uh, he was able to make some plays. I don't know that they'll be able to sustain anything like that. Uh, New Mexico State, unfortunately, again, fun team that we really love. They lose Jerry Kill. They lose Diego Pavia. Um, and I think that they kind of eked out some wins that maybe they didn't deserve last year. Lastly, the one this is the team that I'm hating. I'm going to hate them. It's going to happen. West Virginia ran the Wildcat offense last year and won three games they had no business running the the scheduling gods did them a huge favor uh garrett green i think is not going to be able to replicate that performance unless he can show some intermediate passing on tape that he has not shown anywhere else at at all so those are those are four candidates for me that that are regression um i think west virginia is the one that's kind of weird people want to say oh they extended neil brown no they didn't they exchanged years for his buyout. So <laughs> read between the lines on, on where, how confident they are there. I think green's super one dimensional and they lose a lot on the offensive line as well. So those are, those are my four that I kind of circled. Hey, you had a good season last year. I'm not. Uh, and look, am I going to, am I going to go under on UNC for the fourth year in a row and get burned for the third year in a row? Maybe, but I have to stand by <laughs> it. I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. And so I think, I think on, on the market fundamentals, I just, I'm not sure that they're going to, they're going to be able to survive that loss in May. I don't think we'll have to worry about Max Johnson doing things that uh, that Drake made it. I just don't believe it. That West Virginia schedule, by the way, this is how it starts out. Penn State, then you got Albany, you play at Pitt, and then you've got Kansas, at Oklahoma State, Iowa State, Kansas State, 
at Arizona before the last buy of the year. Like, it's it's pretty brutal this go round. It uh, it yeah. got paid back. Got paid back. Gentlemen, we got 15 minutes here. Let's move into spring camp questions. So this is topic number five on the day. Uh, we've got quite a few spring games that are coming up over the next few weeks, and there's still a lot of teams that I want to get opinions from you guys, the analysts, on. So uh, so we're going to fly through some of these here. Look, uh, I want to start off with this one. Texas Tech. Parker, the uh, the Morton discussion is a little weird, right? Like this... This team underperformed last year relative to the you know dark horse hype that they were getting for whatever reason. Uh, is it possible people were maybe a year early on this, or is this still a middle of the pack bunch in the new Big Twelve? The talent level is not quite there. Uh, they did get five star freshman wide receiver, so that's fun. Always nice to have. Tosh Brooks, super productive running back, very consistent. Has had a lot of volume in his in his career. Um, the defense, you know, I think that we were hearing things like Steve Linton is an amazing defensive end and Syracuse misused him. And we didn't necessarily see that transpire exactly that way. I think, I think last year is the year we were talking about because um, what's the edge who got drafted by the Raiders um, Tyree uh, Wilson. Yeah. Tyree yeah. Wilson left and the Texas tech camp was saying, we think our defensive line is better this year. I don't, I don't, I don't think that was true. Um, the Baron Morton thing is odd. That feels like, um, uh, a little too cautious, a little bit too big kid gloves. And I don't want to speculate about the young man's health, but a healthy quarterback who's young and has multiple years of eligibility and is a West Texas legend like Baron Morton and his family are, uh, should not be shut down for spring practice. So conspicuously think if he legitimately has health concerns and he is your starting quarterback, there is a very good way to do that and, and just pull back on reps and say, we're working with the other guys and have him out there to shut him down completely. All sorts of bells and, and, and whistles are going off in my head. So my question is, is Baron Morton health? Healthy. And uh, can can Texas Tech stay healthy through the entire season? Uh, that's been an issue for, for for them. I think I don't know if that's strength and conditioning. I don't know if that's just bad variants, which is plausible. But um, you really hope this is the year that Baron Morton was going to lead the charge. And and it seems like the, the the cracks are crumbling a little bit, even as they have some good pieces around him on offense. Schedule does set up pretty well for Texas Tech, um, gentlemen. We are we are trying to fit this in. So Kyle, if you're okay with it, I'm going to move on to the next team. Is that good with you? All right. I want to know about Ohio State. Now, Kyle, I know you know as much about this team as anybody could possibly know. Ryan Day with Chip Kelly as the OC. You got Will Howard from Kansas State coming in at quarterback. Uh, Judkins from Ole Miss at running back. A stacked wide receiver core. Uh, You got the superstar freshman Jeremiah Smith, who has no doubt just wowed everybody at practice so far. You still got a stacked defense in year three under Jim Knowles. Uh, it feels like this is the year, right? Like, this program is bought in on this season, right, Kyle? Absolutely. They've bought in a lot on this season. Uh, as a Buckeyes fan, it certainly makes me nervous. You know, when expectations are that high, you know, everybody's saying this is the year. Uh, we know how that goes sometimes. You know, everybody buys in. The whole public thinks this is it. I, I think the big question mark for Ohio State is the offensive line. The offensive line has to be better than they've been. There were very few times last year that they could just line up and run the football down somebody's throat. They had that one drive against Michigan where they ran the ball really consistently. And I was thinking, man, this is what I've been waiting for all year. And then basically that's the only drive that happened uh, the entire season. Um, The offensive line could hold back the offense that has some really great skill position talent. Uh, So to me, that's, uh, you know, far above anything else as far as a question mark for Ohio State. I'm also curious to see what Knowles does with uh, Sonny Styles. Styles is a good player for sure. Uh, I think he will be very good. How they utilize him will be interesting because he's kind of that tweener. Um, where Styles plays, um, I think is going to be really interesting. Knowles, we know he's a really good defensive coordinator. Um, I'm confident their defense will be very good. And then as far as the quarterback order, they've got plenty of depth here. You know, who's going to be the second, third, fourth quarterbacks here uh how many of them will actually stay around you know we even saw Dallin hayden leave yesterday uh from the running back group and i'll be honest i think Dallin hayden's really good so i think hayden is going to help somebody a lot uh i was confused why he didn't get playing time last year you know that was a really surprising yeah. thing and now i mean you can't blame the guy for leaving he wants to go get some playing time they've got two guys in front of him again um but i think it's only two State, guys like that's right, I think that, that's all that's left, right? And and then whoever comes yeah. in from the uh, the the freshman class, 
Right. So. And it would have been, it probably would have been him coming up next year, but now Ohio State's going to have questions again. But Ohio State will be very good, but I think the offensive line is the huge question. Uh, a lot of talk about Julian saying, uh, you know, wowing everybody, the kid that uh, transferred from Alabama, which he signed with Alabama, and then as soon as Saban retired, he uh, he transferred over. So, uh, Parker, I want to know about Georgia. All right, this team was three points away from making the playoff and potentially going for a third straight national championship. This year, the dogs, they're returning the quarterback, Carson Beck, but, I mean, they are losing uh, just a ton of other players. A lot of the the familiar faces at the skill positions, you're not going to have Brock Bowers anymore. Uh, you're not going to have Ladd McConkey. Uh, I'm I'm curious, uh, what do we think of Georgia? Like they, the one thing that they are normally always good at is defending the run, and they were kind of kind of terrible at that last year. Uh, what, what should we expect from the Bulldogs? Yeah, relatively worse against the run last year. But uh, I mean, even all, all season, I'm sure you guys would agree. I had them as the highest power rated team um, and, and think that they were solid on both sides of the ball. I think you've got consistency out of Beck. Obviously, you have age out of Beck there. Uh, I like, you know, Dom Lovett, I think, is is underutilized just because there were so many good guys around him. I think if he's healthy, uh, that's that's a really good first weapon. Uh, weapon. And don't forget, London Humphreys is kind of buried on this depth chart, who's very good. And I think he'll emerge as a threat. The d- offense will look very different so much of the offense was Bauer centric because why would it not be last year and so they're going to have to recreate him in the aggregate with the receiving and the blocking threat there I think the offensive line should be um, pretty solid Nazir Stackhouse on the uh, defensive line we want to see a lot from him I think this year um, especially talking about defending the run some of that sh- much of that matters can he can he funnel the run to the to the linebackers and can their fits be right I, I expect him to do big things here too I have Georgia's number one going into the season that's probably not going to change um, there are some questions about how they're going to use this but this is kirby smart's nick saban moment really it is because because the guys that he kind of won with and and the crescendo of talent he got there and he's turning it over and it's nice to have the quarterback bridge uh for that but they've got a lot of talent a lot of positions you you have to give uh the coaching edge to him and you know every game they're going to play and so talent plus coaching is how you win football games and uh, i i don't think there's any reason to believe that georgia will not be back looking to be in that title game again this year yeah as far as talent goes that is uh that is a stacked roster, just a stacked roster. Uh, Kyle, uh, tell me about North Carolina. What is life like after Drake May, right? The uh, the former LSU and Texas A&M quarterback, Max Johnson, that we just talked about, he appears to be the starter. Uh, who knows what will happen in fall camp, et cetera. But this team's Novembers have been absolutely putrid, and the defense has been the problem. So Chizik is gone. They brought in former Georgia Tech uh, coach Jeff Collins as the new D.C., Tell me, like Kyle, what does Mac Brown have left in the tank here? Well, I mean, I don't think Max Johnson's bad, and I don't think any of us would yeah. think that Max Johnson's bad, but um, it's still a big drop from you know Drake May to anybody that's even a pretty good quarterback. Um, so you know that that's concerning. Uh, the defensive line is a major weakness for them, and it has been for a long time. Uh, with a new defensive coordinator, there's at least potential for uh, something to go. Uh, upwards. I, I see there are some win totals out there of seven and a half. Uh, I, was, I was looking at their schedule just uh, as Parker was saying, as Parker was saying, schedule uh, maybe taking the under. And I'm thinking, yeah, I think under seven and a half might be a decent bet here. Uh, but obviously something I want to look into more. I think North Carolina, the way they've finished seasons and the way they've lost some of these games, they should have never lost. Uh, really concerns me. You know, if you lose those type of games, if you finish the way they finished in those years, I'm concerned about your uh, projections going forward. I've got North Carolina at six and a half wins just based on my early stuff. I I just don't, I don't get it with this team. I don't get it. All right, Parker, we've only got a little bit left, but I'm, I'm going to ask you about UCF. So I've got to reel you in here. Uh, we just talked about him as one of the most underperforming teams from last year. How much do we trust Gus Malzahn? Like, I think he might have the most talented roster in the big 12, uh, especially after adding the Arkansas quarterback, K.J. Jefferson. Uh, you pair him up with Kobe Hudson, uh, the wide receiver, and the running back, uh, R.J. Harvey, who had over 1,400 yards uh, rushing last year. And then you got a whole slew of defensive transfers uh, coming in. Tell me, tell me, what are we looking for here with uh, UCF? 
if Javon Baker hadn't gone to the NFL, we might be talking about UCF in a very different light in terms of what their ceiling is. I think they're very good. The run game, KJ Jefferson and the Gus offense, you just can't speak about it enough. Herb Hand's done a great job with that offensive line. UCF, the only team in the nation to average more than three yards before contact on designed runs. Every time they did a design run, they averaged 3.54 yards before contact. That's absolutely absurd. Jefferson only gives you more yards after contact ability, changes the gravity of the offense, is is reliable I, uh, in, in the role they're going to ask him to, to go. R.J. Harvey, a great running back. I think the big thing about UCF that's really important is, is to watch what the other Big 12 teams are doing. Two examples. You've seen Kendall Daniels from Oklahoma State, and you've seen Abe Kamara from... Um, TCU both say things in their spring interviews about kind of not being safeties anymore and kind of being linebackers, fitting the run, playing at the line of scrimmage. Uh, I believe that the Big 12 is going to be a smash mouth league this fall. I think we're going to see a lot of run game. And to the extent that that's true, it's really UCF's lead uh, to lose. If, if that's the kind of game they're going to play, that's the Gus Miles on wheelhouse, man. Like, And I think that they're absolutely uh, really positioned to be there insofar as you can call anyone a dark horse in the Big 12. I, I think UCF is a dark horse. I think I'm kind of talking myself into them being one of the front runners honestly just because that run game is so solid um and if if you know kj jefferson gives them the dimension i believe they're going to have and those defensive tra- transfers gel I, I really think they are in a position to uh to do make a lot of noise doesn't help or it doesn't hurt that you have florida on the schedule too and what should be another down year for florida and you get a nice signature in 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 uh in state win too so uh, a really nice path setting up for ucf here this uh their schedule is not the easiest, but I mean, it's not, it's not terrifying, right? I think uh, they got to go to Utah and that's kind of like the one hard thing, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a, the very last week of the season, which is, you know, if you're so setting that up to be matter. a, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a little interesting, um, but it's, it, it's not, this is not a scary schedule. Not scary. Uh, let's talk about Pitt right quick. Pat Narduzzi, uh, awful season in 2023. They're looking to reinvent things this season. They've got a new offensive coordinator, Cade Bell. Uh, he His Western Carolina team led the FCS in total offense last year. I think we can count on the defense under Nard Dog, but, uh, but it looked like Pitt was climbing in 2021 and 2022. Uh, but last year kind of cast a lot of doubt on this program. Kyle, tell me, is, is this a bounce-back kind of season for the Panthers, or was last year maybe the start of a trend uh, where – where Pat Narduzzi might be looking for a job soon. I don't want to bet on this team um, either way, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, I mean, it's hard to believe they were so good just a couple of years ago. Remember Kenny Pickett yeah. and the fantastic year they had. Um, then they get rid of the OC, change things up for for some reason. You know, I don't know why. Uh, they go three and nine last year. They average about 20 points per game. New offensive scheme. They're going to play faster. Uh, but quarterback's still a weakness for Pitt. You know, I don't, I don't see anybody here that's going to be a great quarterback. Um, the defensive line should be better. They dropped off badly last year. I think they'll be better, but uh, not a team that I'd be anxious to go and bet a season one total over. Same here. Same here. All right, we got two more teams. Uh, then we'll hit Q&A right quick. Uh, let's talk about Arkansas. Bobby Petrino is back, uh, this time as Sam Pittman's offensive coordinator. KJ Jefferson's gone, but they do have the former Boise quarterback, Taylor Green, coming in. Uh, postgame win expectancy had them at five and a half wins last year. They ended up with four. Yeah, hiring Dan Enos as offensive coordinator was a complete bust. Parker, this schedule is brutal, just brutal. What do we think of the Hogs here? I, who, who are you? What do you What do you want to do, and how are you trying to accomplish those goals? I don't think Arkansas is an answer definitively to either of those questions. And I love Sam Pittman. I, I would love to play for Sam Pittman. I think he's, he's, you know, great and, and, and has the motivation factor and all that. It does appear that they are lacking on the vision front. I mean, they bring in Taylor and green can't retain KJ Jefferson. And that's uh, best case scenario. That's a lateral move. Um, I really don't understand what they want to do there. Uh, and, and I don't know that they have any kind of talent on the edge to make any kind of offensive explosion happen there. I'm, I'm not optimistic about Arkansas here. I think frankly, um, I, I never want to call to, you know, say like this person should lose their job, whatever, like the, the real people. And we should consider that. But I think Arkansas has put themselves behind in the signing cycle by rolling with what they got this year. I like uh, Mike Mack in the chat here. He said, uh, oil slick Bobby. Oil slick Bobby. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, let's hit I mean, if nothing, else, if nothing else, Petrino back in Fayetteville is funny as hell. Like, that's yes. entertaining and funny, but uh, I don't know if they're going to have the talent to make anything other than one kind of, you know, last gasping breath of the Pittman era. I do wonder if, uh, if we're going to get odds on Petrino being the interim head coach by November. 
Very curious Damn. about that one. Uh, let's talk floral. Breath. Another hot seat SEC coach here, of course, Billy Napier. Uh, just another brutal schedule. Just, ugh, this thing. Like, in the year where we they moved to no divisions in the SEC, that's the year that they schedule UCF and Miami. And, of course, they've already got Florida State. Like, they're playing everybody in state. I don't understand it. Like, whatever. Uh, the quarterback, Graham Mertz, is back. Uh, and even with all the guys that are going to the draft or, you know, graduated, transferring out, et cetera, they're still number one in the SEC in adjusted returning production right now. Uh, the new wide receiver core is going to need work. But I'll, I'll tell you this, Kyle, uh, former South Carolina linebacker Pup Howard, he's drawn rave reviews. The secondary sounds pretty awesome. Um, Billy Napier needs a good season in the worst way. Uh, what are we thinking in Gainesville, Kyle? This is a complicated uh, team to try to figure out for me. I still don't think Napier is a, a, the bad coach that some people think he is now. Um, you know, it's it's a difficult situation. And like you said, they have a horrible schedule again. I mean, this is yeah. set up against them. But, I mean, last year they had lots of issues. Graham Mertz really wasn't one of those issues. He, he played well. Um, they got the huge name recruit. And got there, better as the season went. Yeah, he absolutely. Improved the season. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He was fantastic. Better than I would have expected for sure. Um, Florida's defense, you remember the beginning of last year when they looked pretty good? And then last year, the last five games, they gave up 38.2 points per game. So the defense was a major problem. And uh, this is this is for Parker. I think he's gonna like this one. Uh, Florida special teams last year. Really, really bad special teams. Uh, I thought this was kind of funny. Five times last year, they only had 10 men on the field on special teams. That's hard to do. I mean, five <laughs> times in one season, you have uh, 10 men on the field. That's not a good look. Uh, they'll, they'll have to be a lot better on special teams. But, I mean, the the season win total for them, I mean, I'm seeing out there five and a half or four and a half uh, juiced different ways. Gosh, it's going to be it's going to be hard to predict this team. I, I like the uh, well. We'll see. I like the over four and a half if if, if we can get that. Uh, but five and a half is where it gets a little tricky. It gets a little tricky. Um, I don't know. I mean, this team might quit. Like you never know. I just. I, you're right, Kyle. Like I have no idea what to think of this bunch. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's uh, let's see what the chat's asking about today. It's time for the Q and A here. Uh, Fox Mulder jumped in. Are there any rule changes for 2024, or is that still forthcoming? So. Technically, the official stuff is still forthcoming. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's in May uh, is when they they make it all official. But uh, it's already been voted on at, in at least one of the steps in the process. So there is going to be a two minute warning. Um, the uh, no no no, it's the NFL that's doing the uh, the hip drop tackle. Uh, I'm getting uh, confused here. The, Parker, the what do we ones, got? The big ones were a two minute warning. Um, I don't know what the bubbles happening to me right now are. I don't know if you guys are seeing that. If that's a that's Skype either. feature, that's weird. I think I just rose. Uh, two minute warning: the helmet comms. Um, so we don't have people on the sidelines and in funny colors dancing to send in plays. And then uh, the tablets on the sideline are where you can have um, interactivity on the sideline too. So uh, I'm frozen right. and look hilarious, but I think those are the three rule changes that are most important. There was talk maybe about uh, kickoff rules, but I don't know that they have traction on that. They yeah they don't right now the NFL is doing the uh, former XFL kickoff uh, college football is going to pay attention to that and see what happens we'll see we'll see what happens uh, David Nettles uh, he asked about North Carolina we're not worried about that one we already hit North Carolina um, and let's see he said what teams do y'all see surprising some people this year uh, better or worse so uh, I was looking through and some of the teams that I have surprising. Um, I, th I think USC might be really bad again. I think that's a possibility. Uh, let's see. I believe, oh, Virginia Tech, man. So Penn State and Virginia Tech, I think, are going to be awesome this year. Like, I, I'm I'm way high on them. As far as surprises go, I don't have any huge surprises. Kyle, do you have any surprise? Hey, what about Iowa State? Could Iowa State surprise some people? What do you think, Kyle? I'm not the guy to ask for Iowa State at this point. I don't know what to make of Iowa State. Parker would probably be uh, better for that one. As far as uh, teams, I mean, we kind of talked about teams that we thought would uh, underachieve, overachieve what uh, last year would be. Um, man, I don't know. This is a 
This is a, the AAC is going to be really fun. I know we were talking about that a little bit ago. I'm I'm looking forward to like I think somebody could be a good futures bet there in the AAC uh, because I think it's going to be more wide open than what it has been. As far as uh, teams that will, you know, take a big step forward, uh, you know, I, we have I have not I'm not far enough to to talk about too many others. I, I've said Indiana too many times. I can't just default to Indiana every single time, guys. <laughs> I kind of was I I kind of was hoping that bubble would show up for me. I thought that was pretty cool. Like, <laughs> I, I know it's a, it's a weird feature there by Skype, but I, I kind of like the bubble. Uh, let's see, Parker. I think. If, no, 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 Kyle. It was you that brought up Tulane. I think, I think Tulane might drop off quite a bit, yes. so that that might be a surprise to some people. Um, aside from that, I have a I couple really... that are that are kind of fun that I think have a good a better ceiling than people perceive. Yeah, um, would it, hey, would it be any of the Pac two, Oregon State or Washington State? No, because I think optimistic. they could have big years this year. Maybe, maybe I'm not optimistic, but I'm I'm gonna go uh, Rutgers. I think. Okay. Uh, kind of put it together. It looked pretty decent. I think, I think schedule does them a couple favors. Cal bringing in Rogers so that they're not, you know, playing chaos ball there. USF is um, really good on the offensive side of the ball. I think they're taking step forwards. They played hard last year. Uh, and then the other one, Arkansas state, that offense is, is disgusting um, with, with Rainer back there. I think they can hit the deep ball as well as anybody in the conference. Uh, and so they need to make some strides on defense, but they're one I have circled to kind of watch and see how things go just because I do think the offensive potential is, is, is there. I I think that I agree with you. Uh, Butch Jones has proven in the past that he can be a pretty good head coach. Uh, so he's had time there. He's had time. All right. Uh, per the usual, if you got other questions, you can toss them into the comments. And we'll be sure and get in there and answer anything that we can. Or you can hit us all up on X if you want to. Uh, make sure to join in the action over at BetUSTV.com slash join. And uh, keep an eye on the latest odds at BetUSTV.com slash odds. Fellas, that is going to do it for today's show. Uh, We're going to be back again next week, I believe next Wednesday. Uh, Still got some things to figure out for that, but, you know, we're going to uh, we're going to talk NFL draft a little bit next week Uh, and maybe talk some more spring camps and whatnot. Uh, So make sure hit that notification bell so you know when we go live. Make sure that you like the video, tell your friends about the show and subscribe if you have not already done so. Uh, Look, we love and appreciate all you guys. Uh, We're getting ever closer to our fourth season here on the bet us college football show and it is an absolute blast every year so uh, you can follow the fellas on x or twitter whatever you want to call it parker is at stats of war kyle is at kyle hunter picks and you can follow me at gary wce now with that said for bet us where the game begins god bless college football and we will see you all again next week Thanks for watching. We hope you like this video. Subscribe and ring the bell to keep up with all sports content. Don't forget to cover all our major sports. All can be found on BetUSTV.com. Best of luck with your picks.